baby on the deals. Today is the second part of the, the lecture we were doing on tree indexes. Um, just real quick to go through what's on the schedule for you guys coming up. Right, everyone should know that Project One is due on Wednesday. Who here has done Project One already? It's got 100%. Raise your hand. All right, small smattering. Who here has not started at all? In the back, really? You know what? Kudos for admitting this, right? Because I ask every year, and everyone's like, eh, no, right? Nice. Nice. OK. Um, so homework two, again, it was originally due this Wednesday. It's been bumped out to be due on, on Friday uh, at, at midnight. And then uh, project two will be announced on Wednesday in class uh, this week. And then what we're doing is for project two, because everyone, again, last year assumed project two was going to be as easy as project one. Uh, and maybe that I, you heard me say it's easy, and that's why she hasn't started yet. Uh, we're going to do checkpoints. So in the first week and a half, you'll have to submit something on Gradescope to get for sort of the first half of the project done. And then the final grade will be due uh, a week and a half after that. So sort of, again, it's a, it's a checkpoint halfway through to make sure you at least have started and look at the project. So that way you're not trying to build a B plus tree in 24 hours, which is, is going to be a bad, bad time for everyone. OK? So any questions about project one at a high level? Okay, minute. okay. So again, post any technical questions about grade scope or other aspects of, of the coding assignment uh, on Piazza, and then the, the TAs will be able to answer it for you. All right, so today's agenda, we're going to focus on sort of, sort of split into three parts. So in the beginning, I want to talk about are there ways you can use table indexes in a database system that go beyond what we've mostly been assuming or talked about so far. And then I want to talk about two alternative tree-based data structures for, for building a table index as, as a, an examples of other options beyond a B plus tree. The spoiler would be the B plus tree is still superior in some cases to these other two data structures. Um, so, but I still think it's useful for you guys to be aware of them and understand how they work. And then we'll finish off talking about, uh, at a high level, another example of a, not exactly a tree-based data structure, but an example of another kind of index you can have in your database system called an inverted indexes. And we can see how we do full text search on, on these. Okay? All right, so the, the, there was, somebody had a question at the end of the last class um, and about how the database system was, was actually building these indexes. Um, and I don't mean so much like what was the process of actually taking the keys and, and populating the index, but more about are there cases where the data system would automatically build indexes in order, in order to do certain things? And the answer is yes. So most database systems will automatically create indexes to enforce different kind of constraints. So integrity constraints and possibly also referential constraints. So integrity constraint would be like a primary key or unique constraint, right? So like if I call create table like this and I define um, a primary key and, and a unique key, then implicitly what this means is that the database system is going to essentially evoke these SQL commands to create these two indexes for you, right? So for the primary key, it automatically creates a unique index on, on the ID. And then for the, the second value, the bar char, it'll create a unique index on that because it has a unique keyword. And when you think about it, this makes sense, right? Because what's, how else would the database, database system actually enforce these constraints, right? How's it going to know that nobody else tries to insert the the a key with the same primary key, or tuple with the same primary key. The, the, as always in database systems, the, the fallback option is just to do a sequential scan and look at every single tuple to see whether you have the same key already. But of course, now if I, we have one billion tuples in our, in our table, every single time we insert, insert something, we have to scan through one billion tuples. So we can, build a, we can build an index to do this very quickly for us. And it doesn't matter wh whether it's a B plus tree or a hash table. Right, the same idea, it, it, at a high level, it's the same thing. Right? We want something that we can check very quickly to see whether there's a conflict. And if, if, if yes, then we know we should not insert it. If, if no, then it's OK for us to insert it. So this is, this is to do integrity constraints. Um, I also thought it would do the same thing for referential constraints or foreign key constraints. Right? So let's say I have a second table here, bar, and this ID field has a foreign key reference on the value 1 in, in the foo table. So at this point here, uh, the, the value 1 in the foo table is not unique. Uh, so there isn't an index already built for it. And I thought, actually, the data system would automatically recognize, oh, I have my, I'm having a foreign key reference from this table to that table. I don't already have an index over here. I thought it would actually 
they were all going to go ahead and create one automatically for you. Turns out, I tried this in my SQL and Postgres, they don't actually do this at all. Actually, they won't even let you create the foreign key unless you're pointing to something in the parent table that already has a unique index for you. Um, and again, this, the reason why you need an index is the same reason we need it for the, the primary key and the unique constraint. Right? Every single time we would insert something into bar, the foreign key says whatever you're storing for value, sorry, for the ID field, since it has a foreign key reference on the foo table, there must be a key that exists in the foo table that matches what I'm trying to insert in this table. So again, you would use an index to make sure you didn't have to scan everything to, to find a match. So it turns out in Postgres and MySQL, they will throw an error. MySQL actually will throw a silent error for this one. Uh, Postgres will do it correctly, at least MySQL 5.7, and say, you can't create this foreign key reference because you need to have a unique index on, on the foo table for the thing you're pointing to. But there's nothing about the relational model that says that this is the case. I think this is strictly an implementation issue. Um, maybe it has to do with something in the SQL standard that says something about this. But I think at a high level, there's no, there's no reason this is, they have to require this. And this is why I thought they were going to automatically create one. Um, so the only way to really make this work is actually if you change the the foo table to make the, the value, the first value uh, attribute be unique. And again, that automatically builds an index, and then this thing can now point to it. Right? So this is sort of clear, right? Anytime you define a constraint, when you create the table, it'll automatically create the index for you. Now I can also go back and create the indexes manually, um, but you can do it directly when you call create table. All right, so another interesting way to expand what we, how we can use indexes are called partial indexes. And the idea here is that so far we've assumed that anytime I call create index, it's going to scan through every single tuple in that table and build an index for the entire table. But there may be some cases where you don't actually want an index on the entire table. You want a subset of the table. So th this is what is called partial indexes. So the way you, you, you make this work is that in the where, you add a where clause to the create index statement, and you add some additional predicate to say, only index the tuples on the base table, in this case foo, where c equals Wu-Tang, or some expression has to evaluate to true. So inside of this index, we're only going to index a and b, but implicitly, there's some metadata we're maintaining to know that for this particular index, uh, there will only be entries where c equals Wu-Tang fr from the foo table. And so the advantage of this is now if you come along with a query like this, we say where a equals 1, 2, 3, and c equals Wu-Tang, so now we, for, for A, the A attribute, we can get that from the index. But we would, even before then, we would check to see whether the this, this C predicate matches what we've declared as the, the partial index where clause for this index. If it doesn't match, then we can't use the index. If it does match, then we know that it's safe for us to go inside of it and then extract out the, you know, apply the A predicate to get the keys that we want. So this is actually a very common setup in, uh, a lot of applications when you maybe want to part partition the index based on things like date. So you can have like, say you split up your, you know, the, the, the list of orders for your business. You can have one index for each individual month, right? And then this reduces the size of the index. It makes maintaining them much easier because they're more, more compact. Uh, if you have a lot of queries that only focus on a single month, then you don't have to maybe swap in, you know, a, you know, a giant index into your buffer pool that has a bunch of keys that don't actually matter for you. Um, so th this, this, is, this is a very common approach that people use to sort of, uh, sort of manually partition the database or partition the, the data in such a way to reduce the overhead of, of, of large scans. So one additional thing about this query, if you want to notice also too, is that everything I need to answer this query is actually contained in the index itself, right? So I'm doing a lookup on A, I did my where calls on, on C there, and then uh, the only thing I wanted to produce as my output was B. So do I actually need to look at the tuple for this? Right, because how would we normally execute this? We'd follow the index, the index at the value at the, at the leaf node, assuming we have a B plus tree, would have a record pointer. And then we would go follow that record pointer to go get the tuple and then evaluate the rest of the, the query. But for this particular query, there's nothing from the, the, the tuple itself that we don't already get from the index. So these are called covering indexes. So the idea is that a covering index covers all of the data you need to execute a particular query. 
So this is not something you would declare. You don't say make this index be a covering index. It has to do on a, on a query by query basis. Right? The database system can recognize that for this particular query, everything I need to answer the question that you're asking me can be found in a particular index. And if so, it's considered a covering index. Right? So to simplify our example before, for our simple query, select B from foo, where A equals 1, 2, 3, we can get the B that we have needed from the output from, from the index. Actually, the, the arrows are wrong, right? That should be there, that should be there. Right? So A would be for this A, and B for that, 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 that B there. Right? So I've already sort of spoiled it. What's the advantage of this? I don't have to go look at the tuple, because everything I need is, is directly in the index. But we know this from, our, from you guys implementing your Buffable Manager. Memory is limited. So I already have to bring in the index pages in order to traverse the tree to get to the leaf node that I wanted. But now, if I have a covering index, I don't have to go look at the tuple. because There's one less page read, one less entry into the buffer pool I have to make to get the data I need for this query. So this can significantly speed things up in a lot of cases. Especially if you're doing a you know, large range scan where you only want to get things, you know, you, we're doing a large range scan and your tuples are really big. So I mean, to go fetch the data for the tuple would be, you know, you have to read a lot of pages. So this is something that is widely used in the, the, the major commercial systems. Um, MongoDB supports this. Uh, I think Postgres supports it now. They're getting better in Postgres 11, which comes out later. I don't think MySQL, at least MySQL 5.7, does not support this. Uh, I, I don't know what SQLite does. Right, again, the idea here is we can reduce contention in our buffer pool, and not only for the amount of memory we have to fetch from disk to go into the query, but also just the, we have to go into the buffer pool manager fewer times. We take fewer latches. So this, this is a big win in a lot of situations. Now, there may be some cases also, too, where the data I need, though, for, for, to make it a covering index is not, not actually being indexed. Right? In theory, I could, if I have, say, attributes A, B, C on foo, I could index, make an index on A and B and C, uh, and just never, you know, never do the lookup on C. So in this case here, uh, it would make it a covering index more often than not, but you're sort of wasting space now because in your upper levels of the, of the tree, the inner nodes, you're, you're indexing C when maybe you don't actually need to. So a way to get around this is what's called index include columns. And the idea here is that in our create index statement, we add a little include clause, and then we list a bunch of attributes that we want to get packed into the leaf nodes for any key that we're indexing, right? So again, in this case here, I build my index on A and B, but now in the leaf nodes for every entry or unique pair of A and B, I'm also going to include the values of C. So now if I have my query that from before where I say, you know, select B from foo, where A equals 1, 2, 3, and C equals Wu-Tang, I can get A and B from the index, and I can get C from the, the where clause. So I, as far as I know, I know SQL Server from Microsoft supports this. Again, Postgres 11 will support this later this year. My SQL doesn't do this, at least not in version 5.7. SQLite doesn't do this. Um, and I, actually, I don't think Oracle and DB2 does this, but I might, might be wrong. So in theory, again, you could just pack everything in the include clause, but then you essentially end up with an in index organized table, um, and you're, you're just really sort of duplicating things unnecessarily. So sort of this trade-off between how much I want to include in my index versus uh, you know, how much extra space I'm willing to pay to try to speed up queries. Right? So the last thing I want to talk about are uh, what are called functional and expression indexes. Um, Postgres originally used to call these functional indexes. Sometimes in the literature it'll call it expression indexes. But the way to think about this is everything I've shown so far, anytime we create an index, we would just always say, oh, an attribute A, an attribute B. It would copy the exact values of those, of those attributes from the table and, and, and build your keys on those. But there may be some cases where I don't want to store the keys exactly as they appear in the underlying table. So let's say I have a query like this. I have a new table called users, and just think of like people, it's a user account, and you keep track of the, the timestamp of when someone logged in. And I have some query that says, I want to give me all the users that logged in on a Tuesday. So the extract function says, for a given timestamp login, extract the day a week from it. And I'm checking here to see equals two, which is, which is Tuesday, right? Sunday, zero, Monday, one, Tuesday, two. So let's say I build the index on login. 
like this. Would this help me for this query? You're shaking your head no. Why? Because the, the data itself in the where clause that you're looking for isn't stored. It's a function that applies to Correct. So he says the data that we want in order to, in, that we need for, to, to satisfy our where clause is not in the data itself. It's derived from the function we invoke. Right? So think about what this, this, this index is actually doing. It's going to create you a sorted list of all the users based on their login. But I want people that are logged in on Tuesday. So there's not going to be a, a single range where I can get these values that give me all the people that are, that are, that are that logged in on Tuesday. I can maybe be a little bit tricky and recognize my lower bound and upper bound and try to calculate you know, what ranges would be people logging in on Tuesday. But as far as I know, no data system would actually, would actually do that. So this index doesn't help us. So instead, what we can do is that we can just take the expression that we want to compute and embed that in the index itself. So now, when I define my, what keys I want to put in my index, instead of having you know, a, the, the single attribute, I can then put the same function I would have normally in my where clause. In this case here, we're going we're to index everyone based on the day of the week. right? We're still getting everybody on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. And then now, when I execute this query, uh, it can, it, can, you know, it, it, can, it can know that I have the function in my where clause exactly matches what I need in my, in my index, and therefore I can use that. So is there another way to sort of do the same thing and it, that we talked about before so far? Another type of index we can use to, to essentially do the same thing for us? Say we want to get exactly everybody that's on a Tuesday with an index. How would I do that? Partial index, right? The where clause can just, again, to be anything you have in a select statement in a where clause, you can put in your create index in a, in a where clause, right? So let's do a demo. And we can see a little bit now uh, also how Postgres is going to pick plans. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, somebody asked, why am I always using Postgres in my demos? Um, is it because I'm like, a, you know, a, a, a fanboy or just, you know, obsessed with Postgres? Postgres is really good. Uh, Postgres has all the things that we're talking about in this class. Postgres has available to us, um, and we can. Uh, it's almost a, you know, almost a textbook definition or, or implementation of a database system. And like, what, another thing I like about Postgres too, also, is that it has many of the things that the commercial guys have. Postgres eventually gets as well, right? I said that the uh, index include columns was in SQL Server. That's where it's first implemented. Postgres is adding that now in, in eleven, and it's open source and free. Right? It's amazing. All right, so let me do this. Let me drop the table of users. I'll create a new one. Right? It only has two fields. It has the ID field for the primary key, and it's just an auto increment key always increasing. And then it's going to have this timestamp field. And then let's generate some, some synthetic data. So for this, what I'll do is I will uh, do now. I will uh, do an insert query that it's going to insert into the login table, and then it's going to. There's this function in Postgres called generate series that's just going to generate uh, a, you know, a monotonically increasing list of values. So it's going to generate me a bunch of timestamps from 2017, January 1st, until today at one month, a uh, one-minute intervals, and it's going to it create uh, 900,000 records. So let's say I take the query that I wanted, right, like this. If I run it, it comes back pretty fast. But if we go check the query plan, um, you see that it's doing a sequential scan on the users table in order to apply the, the predicate. Right? So if I now go create my index on um, just the login field, when I run explain, again, it doesn't pick the index because it doesn't help us. Right? It, it only does a sequential scan. So let's drop that index. And make one with the partial index, so, so it's me, the, the expression index. And now when I run my query plan, it recognizes that it can use the, the index that it's created for a uh, for the for to do an index scan. I'll explain what a bitmap scan is, is later on, but basically just think about it, it, it it's how Postgres is keeping track of what tuples match. So now let's create though the uh, the partial index that I had before. So do Postgres login, where hmm. right? 
So this is creating the partial index where I'm still going to get all of the login information, the, the login timestamp, but my where clause says only get people where they logged in on, on Tuesday. So now if we go back to our query plan, let's take a, let's take a bet. Who says Postgres is going to pick the partial index? Who says it's going to pick the, uh, the expression index? Raise your hand for partial. And if you say, say, raise your hand for the expression index. So why do you think it would pick the expression index? It's more specific. Although, no, the partial index is pretty specific, right? The partial index was, which one was it? This one? This one, right? Where extract, where, where day of week with lo from login equals two. That's exactly what I want to execute in my query, right? Yeah, wrong one. My index is where day a week from login equals two. So pick the partial index because again, it knows how to match the where clause with what's in, with, that's defined for the index with the where clause that's defined in your query, and and pick that. If I change this to be three, right, it picks the the expression index because the partial index doesn't have any of that information, All right? So this is sort of clear what's going on underneath the covers. And it uses the same, all the same storage information that we talked about last class, right? It's doing the same thing, right? There's nothing special because it's an expression. It just knows that when I insert a record, I run that expression and insert that into uh, as, as the key rather than the, the original attribute, the original value of the thing I'm indexing. Yes? His question is, when should you create or drop an index? Uh, is that sort of like a, a, an open-ended, broad question? Are you, do you mean, you mean something specifically in the implementation, or is it like, like if I'm administrating a database, when should I do this? Yeah, I mean, from the application level. So this question is, from the application level, when, when is the right time to drop a created index? So this is essentially what DBAs do for you, right? You, you basically look for your application and say, what queries are running slow? And which ones are, you know, what queries are running slow and are the indexes that can help me improve the performance? Right? So there's tools that sort of do this for you. In a lot of cases, for like OOTP applications, like if you use like an ORM, like, you know, Django or Ruby on Rails, you know, you define, you get implicit index for free, right? Because you say, I want this attribute unique, because most of the time I'm doing lookups on that. So then it'll create the index for you. So you get you, things speed up. The more complicated things are when you have to look, you have to look at what queries are running slow, and there's ways to turn on this. It's called the slow query log in MySQL and Postgres and those systems to say, show me all the queries that run longer than 20 milliseconds. You look at a bunch of those and say, well, what's what's the, what indexes could I use to speed things up? All right. So it's sort of like you just have to look and see what's slowing you down. There's no like there's no like conventional wisdom or hard fast rule to say if your query looks like this, then add an index. If your query looks like that, then drop an index. It depends on the application what you care about. Right, because maybe the case that I have a query that's just like it takes you know 100 milliseconds, but it runs once a day. So who cares? Right? It depends. It depends on what you want in your application. Okay. All right. So any questions about like these other ways to use indexes? All right. Pretty straightforward. And again, it just builds on top of the things we've already talked about. Like once you have a you know awesome underlying data structure that you know is is thread safe and, and reliable. You can then start implementing all these other cool things on top of this, and this is essentially what you know the, the why more uh, older database systems have more way more features than the than like the newer guys. Like Postgres has been around for a while, and they're just adding all this awesome stuff, you know, on top of their existing infrastructure. All right, so I want to take a step back now and start talking about different data structures. So the way to think about what we talked about last class with the B plus tree is that. We were essentially building a sorted list of keys, right? If you think of like the leaf nodes, the leaf nodes were just just essentially just a linked list of keys in sorted order, and then there was some infrastructure on top of them, the the key the the, the tree portion of the data structure that we would use to route ourselves to find the data that, that we're looking for. But the most simplest way to actually implement an index would be just just a single linked list, right? Um, the problem, though, is that all the operations on that linked list would be always in uh, on time because you have to do a linear search, right? So again, think of this as just the leaf nodes of our of our B plus tree. We have keys 
And then we have values, uh, the value portion is just a pointer to the next key. So anytime I want to find a particular key, I don't, I can't jump to the middle. I have to scan across from the beginning and check as I go, go, go along. Worst, worst case scenario, I'm at the end. Best case scenario, I'm the first one I'm looking for, right? And again, it's just, it's just a simple linked list. So one way to sort of speed things up is that rather than doing our searches in linearly by just looking at one key after another, we could actually maybe build sort of a way to jump ahead in our linked list to find keys, uh, the key that we're looking for more quickly, right? So a really simple way to do this would just be add a, another pointer for every other element that points to, that jumps over the, that element, or that key, right? So from key one, I can either go from key two or jump ahead and go to key three. So now if I'm looking for a particular key, say key, key five, I can look at key one, so that's not the one I want. Jump ahead to key three, that's not, not the one I want either. Jump ahead using the top level over key four to key five and then I found what I wanted. Yes? Are the leaf nodes in contiguous regions of memory? So this question is, are the leaf nodes in contiguous regions of memory? For this, assume no. But if, if we say yes, then can we just do like a binary search? His statement is, if, 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 we, if we assume yes, can we just do a binary search? Um, that'll make searching go faster. That makes insertion slower, because now you've got to slide everything over. Right? Just keep it really simple. Just keep it simple with a linked list. Right? It's the easiest data structure to implement. All right, so we can do this and skip ahead, and that helps us, that cuts things down further. Uh, we can just go add another level of pointers and, and, and skip every fourth one, right, and so forth. Right? So now to find the key that we would be looking for is, is we can follow along the top point, and we, re we realize we, do, we go too far, then we go down to the next level, and we follow those pointers until we reach the very bottom and find the thing that we want, or find that, that we've, we've gone past. Uh, the key where we, we've gone past the key where our key should be so we know it's not there. So this at a high level is what a skip list is. So a skip list is essentially multiple levels of linked lists, um, and you're going to have extra pointers that skip over uh, intermediate nodes in your linked list. So that's a quick show of hands. Who here has, has, has heard of a skip list before? Okay, about, about, a, about a third, maybe less than half. Um, so Again, the way to think about it is that we're going to have multiple levels of these linked lists, and we're going to have these extra pointers that allow us to jump ahead things. Now, if you sort of think at a high level, when I show the diagram, it's going to look a lot like a B plus tree, right? But we'll see some differences later on because we don't have to end up doing uh, any rebalancing any time we do an insert and delete. With a linked list, we don't have to ever do splits and merges because all we know that we, we want to add our entry, we just update the guy that came before it to now point to us instead of pointing to the, to the one that we, we now point to. So this is sort of one of the advantages you're going to get with, in a skip list. So it's not a new data structure. Uh, it dates back to, I think, 1990. It was invented by a professor at uh, University of Maryland. But in the last 10 years, uh, skip lists have become sort of fashionable um, because you can actually implement one as a lock-free data structure. Um, we can argue whether that's a good idea or not, and actually show numbers that show that it is not a good idea. But there has been a couple systems uh, in recent years that, that use skip lists. So RocksDB is a log-structured system that we talked about earlier. Right? Instead of storing the tuples, they store logs in, in the heap files. And then they build an in-memory skip list to keep to map you from keys to offsets in the log. Wired Tiger builds, builds an in-memory skip list as an ephemeral data structure when they fetch in a page. Again, sort of the same thing. You, you build some way to jump to different offsets very quickly in a, in a page. The most famous skip list database system is MemSQL. We can talk offline about how they came around to deciding to use a skip list, but they're all in on skip list. They do not have a B plus tree. They do, they do not have any other index. They're all, they use nothing but skip lists. Um, yes? Uh, who did that make the complicated? Why does what, sorry? Uh, what, what will make more complicated? So his, his question is, does this make insertion more complicated? Let's go through an example of insertions, and you'll see why not. Again, comparing this with the B plus tree. The B plus tree, I do an insertion, and I may have to split my node, but then that, that recursively goes up the tree, and I have to split my parent, which may split the root, may split everyone else. So with a single insertion, a worst case scenario, I have to rebuild the entire tree. In a skip list, you never have to do that. Every modification is always localized to the, the portion of the, of, the, of the list you're modifying. Okay, so the, the way to think about skip lists, as I said, is just a, a collection of linked lists. And so at the very bottom 
is like the, the leaf nodes in the B plus tree. You have to have a, every single key that exists, right? Because otherwise, you know, you'd have false negatives because the key wasn't be there, right? So every key that exists is always at the, at, the, at the bottom, and you have pointers from one key to the next. But then the next level above that is going to have links or pointers to every other key. Going above that, you're going to have every fourth key and so forth. So in general, what's going to happen is at every level, you will have half as number of pointers as the level below you. And so the way you figure out whether you want to add a pointer at a, at a level uh, when you do an insertion is you actually flip a coin. You use a random number generator to decide whether you're going to actually add a, uh, a pointer at a level. So this ends up making this a probabilistic data structure, which is different than the, than the B plus tree, or the radix tree you want to see in a second, which are deterministic data structures. So that means that if I had take the same set of keys and I insert it into my skip list and you know, use a different random number generator to seed, I may end up with a different physical structure of the data of, of, the, of, of the index every single time I, I rebuild it. In a B plus tree, you wouldn't have that because it's deterministic, meaning when I do an insert, I know where it's going to go, and then if I have to do a split and merge, as long as you don't you know, flip a coin when you decide whether you want to steal from the right sibling or the left sibling, uh, you're going to always end up with the exact same physical layout of, of, the, of the data, no matter how many times you rebuild the index. In the case of the skip list, it can change every single time because you have this randomness to it. So because, though, uh, even though it, it's, it's, it's going to be random, the math works out that we'll get approximately log n uh, search and insertion operations, which is the same thing we saw in the, in, in the B plus tree. So worst case scenario, we get completely unlucky and, you know, that we always have no, no point of the, at the upper levels. But, you know, with a billion keys, that's almost impossible to ever happen. So in the end, we work out the, almost the same uh, asymptotic properties as, as, as a B plus tree. So let's look at an example. So, as I said, the, the way to think of skip list in some ways is just a, it's just another B plus tree. Um, the way everyone represents it in, in, in these diagrams is always a flat list like this. Right? But if you sort of think, you sort of rotate it in some ways, it looks a lot like a, a, a binary tree. So the first thing to point out is that we have at the beginning and the end, we have the, st the starting entry point for our, our index with these different levels, and at the end we have just these, these markers to say we reached the end of the linked list at a given level. Right? And then with each level, we have the probability that we're going to have a, a pointer for a given key uh, you know, based on how high we are. So at the very bottom, the first level, the probability that we're going to insert a pointer for a particular key is 1, and above that it's half that, and above that it's half of that, and so forth. The very bottom is, is again, is the linked list. This is where you have to have every, pop, every key. Every key we're going to represent as a triplet. So you have the key that, that you inserted. Uh, the value would be, be the record pointer to, to the actual tuple. And then you have a pointer to your, to your neighbor in, in the linked list. In the levels above that, you replace the record pointer with actually a pointer to the, the same key below you. So in order to have a key above in, in an upper level, you have to have, obviously, the key below you. So this vertical sort of strip of having the same key uh, across different levels is called a tower in, in skip list, right? So what, that means that I can't have a key two be up in here in level three without having a key in, in level two. All right, and then at the top one, we haven't, we haven't had any keys end up in the first level, so it, it just points to the, the, end, the end marker. In reality, what would, the way this would work is you just keep a, a counter that says, how many, what's the highest level I have, so that when you do an insertion or do a lookup, you know where to always start off with. So in this case here, you'd say, all right, the highest link I have is in the second level, so I always stop, start at level two. I never start at level three. All right, let's see an example of how to do an insertion. So let's say I want to insert key five, and I've conveniently left a space here to insert key five in my diagram. So to do the insertion, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to flip a coin Decide how many levels we want to go. We want to add add our 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 new key into. So we always have to have a key at the first level. We flip a coin to the second level. It, it comes up heads. So we say yes. We want to insert it. We flip a coin again for the third level. It comes up heads. So we want to insert it again. We flip it the third time, and it comes up tails. So we know we don't want to add uh, a new level. All right. We keep going until we hit tails. So all right. So that means that we want to add key five to these these three levels like this. 
So at this point here, I've allocated the memory. I've created my triplets to store the key, but it's not fully integrated into the index because the keys that come before it in the list still are pointing to uh, key 6. So key 4 is pointing to key 6 on the first level, and key 4 is pointing to the endpoint in, in, the, in the second level. So the first thing I need to do in my tower is add the pointers now going down. Right? So again, that way, if anybody lands at the higher point, they can always reach, reach, reach to the bottom. And then, going from the bottom to the top, I'm now going to, uh, all right, same thing, I have to have pointers to the end, but going from the bottom to the top, I'm going to add, I'm going to modify the, 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 the key to come before me to now point to me. Right? And at this point, the key is integrated into the index. Meaning anybody that scans along the bottom will find us. But what would happen if we scan across the top? Will we find it? No. Right? Is that, is that still okay? She's taking her yes. And you seem real emphatic about it. Why? That, so is, that we're going to eventually add it? But think of this scenario, right? At this point here, the, the index looks like this. Key 5 is there. Anybody that just comes along the bottom and scans along here would find it. But anybody that maybe starts at the second level, scans along here, and they're looking for key 5, this thing still points to the end. So it would say, oh, well, key 5, there's nothing beyond key 4 at this point uh, that I'm looking for, so I've just skipped skip past it. Right? It would miss it. It would be, be a false negative. So I'm not going to explain it all in detail now, but it's sort of set us up a little bit for next class and later on when we talk about transactions. This is OK to have this. Right? This, is, this, is, this is a higher level logical thing that where transactions may not see all the changes immediately, and that's OK. What's not OK if we have corrupted data structure. So this thing, instead of pointing to key 5 or key 6, it pointed to garbage. And some other thread came along and, and followed that pointer and started reading garbage. That would be bad, right? Because we would crash. We'd read something we shouldn't we shouldn't be reading. But in this case here, the data structure is sound. All the pointers are going to to the correct things. Just whether a thread comes along that you know maybe it was here at the moment this thing got got flipped in, and it would miss it and keep going. Logically, that's okay. We can we can rectify that later on. But physically, uh, it's you know physically we don't want to have it point to nothing. So this is a good, good, good distinction between having a consistent data structure versus a corrupted data structure. The higher level semantics of what our queries are doing are allowed to miss this change, uh, but we obviously don't want to crash. So we'll cover more about this on, on, on Wednesday. We're mostly going to focus on how do we make sure our, our data structure are thread safe. When we talk about transactions, we, then we talk about the problem of one transaction not seeing the changes from another transaction that they probably should. Right? So the main thing I'm trying to point out here is like swapping the pointers like this may not make it so that any thread can see the data that we need at this moment, but that's okay. I could just avoid all this by having a single latch on the entire data structure so that no thread could, could ever read it anytime I'm modifying it, but that would be slow because now everyone's going to get bottlenecked on that. So instead, we're going to have, uh, we just do the single sw compare and swap here, allow other threads to read inconsistent data, and that's okay. Okay? All right, so again, now I'm going from, from the bottom to the top. I go to the next level, same thing. I swap my pointer. Now anybody comes along that sees us, and then the level here gets swapped in, and then now anybody can find us. And now our key is fully integrated. All right, so that, does that answer your question about inserts? OK. Yes? So how do you know which node is before you? This question is, how do you know which, which node is before you? So to do an insert, you have to basically figure out where I, you do a search and figure out where I should be, and you keep track of the steps along the way. Okay. Yes. It seems like you, you do search on every level. And you do insert. This question is: Does this mean you do a search on every level? Uh, yes. Actually, let's go through that example now. Okay. All right. So they say I want to. Oh, do, yeah. Sorry. So your, your statement, your question is: the gap between two nodes at a different level are not the same. What was the second part you said? Same what? I mean, uh, previously the, the gap between two and four is two. Yes. Right now, 
right now four and five to gap one. Ah. Not the same. All right, so his question is, in this case here, at the second level, key two jumped over one tuple, one key here, and went to key four. But now, this, at this point here, the, the number of tuples that this thing's going to jump over is, is actually zero, because you go to there. So again, it's a probabilistic data structure. I flip the coin to decide where I want, how high I want my tower to be when I insert it. So this, by chance, by random, it said, all right, I want something key two, and I want, oh, sorry, level two and level three. So this made the gap be zero, right? In practice, with a really large data set, this randomness works out that, on average, you're, you're, you're skipping at least one. In this particular example, it doesn't, right? Because the alternative could be, if you think about it, if you, if, you, if you had to enforce it so that every single time you add a new key and you want to add it to a level, that you always make sure that it jumps at least one, uh, if, if now I insert, say, um, if I insert, say, something 4.5 in here, I would have to then maybe uh, modify other things in the tree to make sure that it's only jumping one. But it's random. I don't care, I don't care whether it's exactly one or, or some, some, you know, exactly one or zero or something larger than that. I don't care. Because it makes the change be localized. And in practice, with a large enough, you know, with a billion keys, it works out just fine. Yes? Sorry, follow up question. So if you insert like 4.5 and then you flip the key. Flip, then, flip a coin. Uh, sorry, sorry, flip a coin. So meaning on every level, there will be like three constructions. Let's say like, uh, so you need to put 4.5 on level 1 and level 2 and then level 3 as well, and then there will be like three constructions on every level. Right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So his, his question, basically start here. I added key 5, right? Yeah. Initially, nobody points to me. Now I go through. And I, at every level, going from the bottom to the top, I have to then swap this pointer now point to me. Yep. Yes, you have to do. What's that? So his question is: Is the cost of doing the swap yep. small? Yep. Absolutely, yeah. So in if, it, if it's an in-memory index, it's compare and swap. In modern CPUs, it's a single instruction. That's super cheap. Again, it, it, it'd be done atomically. Um, this is, so he made a comment before too. Is like if I assumed everything is in pages together or continuously in memory, then uh, you know maybe you don't have to swap pointers as much because you just you just move things around. The way people try to implement, typically implement these sort of as a first pass is just you just have every node sort of be its own sort of chunk of memory, and then you you, you do you do have to swap this pointer. If you cluster them together or group them together, you can you may not have to actually swap a pointer, but in, in our example here you do, and it's cheap to do. And again, I, if I do it here, my key's in there. If, I, if another thread may come along and miss me, that's OK. And then, I, and the, and then eventually, I'll, I'll swap the rest. And then now I'm fully integrated. Right? The reason why we go from the bottom to the top, that way, if someone, someone is here, uh, if I'm here and someone's trying to insert key 4.5 at the same time I'm trying to insert key 5, we do the compare and swap. Only one of us is going to win, because the compare and swap says, Check to see whether the, the value I want to replace in memory equals what I think it should equal. If yes, replace it with my new value. If no, then you fail. So if both these guys try to do the compare and swap, thinking that key 4 points to key 6, only one of them will succeed. The other one has to back off and retry. So doing this is really cheap to do. OK. Let's just see how we do a search now. All right, so I want to find key 3. So I, at this point here, I know from my data structure, I have three levels. So I also have to start at the first level. So I'm going to look ahead in the, in the pointer, and it says, oh, it points to uh, key 5. I know that key 5 is greater than key 3. So I can't continue along this path in, in, in the skip list at this level. I have to go down to the next level. And I do the same thing. I follow along the path. Now I see key 3 is greater than key 2. So I do want to skip ahead and jump along, and now look ahead to the next the next node, the next key, which is key 4, but key 3 is less than key 4, so now I, I go down. And then now I just scan across the leaf nodes until I find the one thing I'm looking for. So it's sort of like you're stepping down different levels, trying to go as far as you can across horizontally, because that means you're skipping way more keys at the bottom. But at some point, you'll hit a boundary and say, I can't go past this because the key that I'm looking for is less than what your key is, so I go down a level. And eventually I reach the very bottom, and then now it's just a linear scan to find what I wanted.
So this clip. Right, it's, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so let's do deletion. So the thing I want to focus on here is that um, we're going to have this distinction between logical deletes and physical deletes. So a logical delete, is, delete means that any thread that comes along should, will not see the key I just deleted, but physically it's still there in memory, it's still inside of my pages. Right? That's different than what we saw in the B plus tree, because when we did a delete, we, we went and took the key actually out. We may have to do a merge to, re, to, to, to reshuffle things around accordingly. So what I'm going to do now is along the leaf nodes, or sorry, the bottom level for my, for my, my keys, I'm going to add a simple Boolean flag that says whether it's been deleted, true or false. So now let's say I want to delete key 5. I do my search, just like I did before, and I walk down until I find the, the leaf node that I want, for the key that I want to delete, and then I just flip its flag to be true. So now at this point, any thread that comes along and, they see, and they're looking for key 5 would say, oh, the, the leap flag is, is true, therefore I should just ignore it. Right? But physically it's still there. And then now what I do is I start removing the pointers going in reverse direction from the top to the bottom. So I'll unlink it from, from the top level and, and the second level and, and so forth. And the very bottom I get here, and then now anybody that's scanning along would, would be rerouted around me. So the, the reason why we're doing this is because it's sort of where, where we want to let everyone know that things have been deleted as soon as possible, so to minimize the window where someone might get a false positive. And so because we have to go to the top to the bottom, right, we just go. To, we want to flip this thing to be true, so that way as we're going down our towers and unlinking things, anybody that comes along can just ignore the key that it sees, right? Because otherwise, we we would only delete it until we reach the very the very bottom, right? And then once, once we and then you know we're not going to talk about uh, garbage collection or, or thread safetyness here, but once you know that no other thread could ever possibly be looking at your node, it's okay to free the memory. Again, this avoids having people read corrupted data. All right. So to finish up, skip list. The advantages are uh, the Main thing is that the insertion and deletions do not require any major rebalancing because all the changes are localized to just that point of, of the of the skip list. Right? It's not like the B plus tree where you have to recursively go up and do splits and merges that calls you to reshuffle everything. Um, in practice, the the skip list could potentially use less memory than a typical B plus tree um, if you don't use the optimizations, the, the compression stuff we talked about last class. Um, it only, you only get that benefit, though, if you don't include reverse pointers. So I showed, again, the, the, at the, the lowest level, the linked list always went in one direction. If I want to do a reverse scan, I can't do that as, as is being shown because I don't have pointers in the other direction. If I add other pointers in the other direction, then, then I can't do that compare and swap atomically that I talked about, and I have to you know, store extra space for those pointers. So in the case of MemSQL, if you find the early blog post when they announced, hey, we're a new in-memory database system and we use skip lists because they're lock-free, the first thing people point out is, well, the skip lists can't go in reverse direction. So then the Mem MemSQL guys came back and said, well, the way you, you solve that, is you just make a, second, a separate second skip list that has things sort of in reverse order. And that defeats the purpose of the memory savings you get from the skip list. So the downside of the skip lists are that they are not disk and cache friendly, as he, he was asking about before. Because we're, we're following all these pointers and jumping along to the different locations every single time we traverse things. Um, and then, as I said, reverse search is, is non trivial to implement. You have to do something extra, which we'll cover in the advanced class uh, of how to do re reverse searches when you don't have pointers in the other direction. So, in the advanced class, 15, 17, 21, for the last two years, in the spring, the second programming project was you have to implement your own thread safe, lock free skip list. Um, debating whether to do that again this year. Um, I, don't know how I don't know how interesting it is, and, and skip lists are not that common. But anyway, all right. Any questions about skip lists? Yes. His question is: Are they stored with the buffer pool? Yes. If if you want to be backed by disk, yes, it means you have to organize it in pages. Anything you want to be able to spill to disk has to be stored in the buffer pool, organized as pages. So keys would be like. So you, you you'd have to you can pack multiple keys in a single page, right? But then it. it that does require rebalancing if you now insert things that expand the key and you need to move it left and right. Yeah. Well, 
word level skip list increase as we insert things? His question is, will the level of the skip list increase as we insert new things? Yeah. Yes, because the probability that you're going to have a tower go up to a, a really high level increases with the more keys you have. So, uh, so when, when will we decide to uh, split, increase the level? It's random. it's random. Every time I insert, I flip that coin. And I keep, I keep going until it comes back with, a, with tails, meaning like false. Right? It's a random data structure. Or, or it's a, a probabilistic data structure. Yes? So why do we want to rely on probability to build this data structure? This question is, why would you want to even use a prob probability to build this data structure? Uh, over a B plus tree, or, just in, or like for this particular data structure? Like, I mean, what's the alternative? The alternative would be you have a heuristic and say, all right, for a key that looks like this, I add so many levels. And remember I said before, the issue of that one now is, like, I don't know what all the keys are going to be ahead of time. So I may pick a bad heuristic that would say, you know, for keys that mod 2 equals 0, you know, add it to level 2. Key mod 2 equals 3, add it to level 3. That may be bad because I may never see keys that have to have those particular values, and I had just I had just have a stupid linked list at the bottom. By making it random, you sort of make a good uh, best effort for all possible domains of values. And again, for really large key spaces, it works out fine. For a billion keys, it, it'll look it almost looks exactly like a B plus tree. All right, radix trees. So radix trees are less common. Um, but what's interesting about them is that they, they, they have different properties in a B plus tree and a skip list. So I think they're worth, worth discussing. Um, and I think that the current research trend is that these things are very interesting and a lot of the newer systems are thinking about, or people are thinking about exploring them now. Um, so I'll also say ahead of time, so uh, there's an in-memory database system out of Germany called Hyper that is very influential and state of the art. It got bought by Tableau last year. They use a radix tree as their main data structure. They don't have B plus trees. I know the data stacks guys that are working with Cassandra. They are super keen on B, uh, on, on radix trees and tries. Last time I talked to them, and they're looking about integrating uh, tries all throughout Cassandra, which I think is really interesting. So, a radix tree. The way to think about this is that we're going to represent keys we want to store in our in our index by their individual digits, rather than than the entire key. And so by digit, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, like a number like one, two, or three. Like if I have a string of, of characters, each character is a digit. Or, or if I have a number, the each, each number is a digit. So the, the reason why we're going to do this is now we're going to be able to do comparisons on the digits of the keys in sort of prefix order, one by one, rather than having to examine the entire key. So you sort of already do this in some ways with, with certain functions, like doing string comparison. Like, you know, it's, it's a for that walks through the characters at the beginning of the string and actually compare them. Um, and if it stops when soon as you don't have a match. But now the data structure itself is going to be designed to do this very efficiently. So the, the reason why what's, what's interesting about it is that now the height of the tree is no longer dependent on the number of keys that you have. Like in the B plus tree, if I insert a billion keys, right, depending on what my fan out level is, how many ent entries I, I want to pack in my node, that's going to de determine the number of levels that I have. In a radix tree, the, the height of the tree actually depends on the length of the key. Right? So I could have a billion tuples or billion keys and have a really uh, you know, a, a small key because they're not really long strings. But I could have another billion keys with really long strings, and now my index will be really long. Right? So, in a radix tree, we're not going to not require any rebalancing the major level or reshuffling the same, same way we do splits and merges in uh, in a B plus tree. And instead of actually storing the entire key at every single level, again we just store these digits, and then we can reconstruct the key based on what path we take down into the tree. So, quick show of hands: Who here has heard of a radix tree before? Even fewer. Patricia tree? Anybody? Who here has heard of a try? All right, there we go. Good, excellent. So a radix tree is just a variant of a try. Okay? So here's a try. So I have three keys, hello, have, and ha hello, hat, and have. So in this sort of visual representation, in the try, 
I'm storing at every edge represents a single character of, of a key. So at the root, I have H because all three keys start with H. In the case of hello, I'm going to have now path down H E L L O. Right? And I can reconstruct that key by following that path. So if I want to check, is, is the key hello in my index? I can start at the root. I see H, I see E, I see L L O, and so forth. And I reach my record pointer at the bottom. In the case of hat and have, they both start, the second character is A. So I only need one entry for A. And then I have my split point for the E for have and T for hat. So the tries were first discovered back in 1959 by some French dude. Um, and then two years later after that, there was a professor, uh, Edward, Edward Fredkin, coined the term uh, try as a, as a concatenation of retrieval tree. Um, he apparently is faculty at CMU. I think he's retired. He's like a famous dude. He doesn't show up in any faculty meetings, but apparently he's here. I don't think he's in the, he's in the directory. Um, so a radix tree is sort of like a, a compressed version of the try. So in the try for H-E-L-L-O, no other key shared those, those characters after the, after the H. E-L-L-O was specific to hello, but it still had that entire path. In a radix tree, you recognize that nobody else stores, is storing um, E-L-L-O. So I just have a single edge with that information there, right? Sort of, it's packed together. Right? And the same thing for I, I, hat and have, we're both sharing A, so I have my entry for A. And then for have, nobody else shares VE, so it's there by itself, right? So, that, so a radix tree is a compressed version of a try. If you look in the literature or Wikipedia, sometimes they're called Patricia, Patricia trees. It's not named after a person. It has some other meaning from the 50s or 60s, I don't remember. Um, sometimes in the literature, these are called uh, suffix arrays or suffix trees. The, the basic idea is the same. In, the, in databases, we call them radix trees. So let's see actually how you would actually really store this. So nobody actually really stores the in that sort of edge-oriented diagram that I showed before, where you have the, the, the characters, the digits stored in the edges. You store them in nodes, right? And then your nodes have to fit in pages. So the way you would actually implement this is maybe try to pack in as much data you can within a single page at a different level in, in, in the tree. So in this case here, for the second level, I have ELO for hello, and then A shared by hat and have, I would pack them into a, a single page. Now let's see if I want to insert a new key. I want to insert hair. In this case here, I would recognize that the H and A are both shared so that I just follow along to my, to my, my, my third level here, and then I see that I already have space to store IR, and so I can pack it in there. So it's not, um, we are going to do, potentially do, do merges, but we never have to do, uh, we may have to do splits as well, but it's, it's always sort of, again, um, and we never have to do it complete rebalancing the same way that you have to do it in, in a B plus tree. So let's say I want to delete hat and have, so I go ahead and find my two entries here, and I delete them. And then I recognize that I have R by, IR by itself, and I can decide to leave it here if I wanted to, and everything's still correct. Or if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, I'm going to be aggressive about using, re, you know, reusing memory or saving space, I can just con con compress it and move it back up. Right? So this sounds awesome, right? Because now we're storing, we're using way less data to store our like, keys. Like if this was a B plus tree, if I want to store these, these, these two keys, hello and, and, and and here, I mean, going back here, maybe is the, the, the better example. When I had all my keys in there, um, back here, I would have maybe the root would have hello or hat. I would have it you know, in, in its entire form. And then down below in the leaf notes, I'd have the keys in their entire form again as well. In this case here, I don't have to do that. I only store the key essentially once to represent a path into, to, to a record pointer. Can anybody point out what the obvious downside of this is, though? What's the one operation I said was really efficient in a B plus tree? You made the hand gesture. Sorry. Yes. Sequential scans along the leaf nodes. How do I? How would I do that here? Right. I can't. Right. I essentially have to because I because if I scan along these guys, I don't know what the key is because the key's not being stored down with me. So I essentially have to keep a stack of, of how I traverse in the tree. And go back up and go back down in order to scan along the leaf nodes until I find my endpoint. 
So this is gonna be way more efficient for for storing storing keys. It'll make uh, in a second we'll see why, how why point queries are much more much more efficient. Insertions are much more efficient as well. But the scans are gonna be much slower because again we have to do backtracking. All right. So the the major thing to talk about though is how we're actually gonna store keys in our in our radix tree. So not all the attributes we want to store can we just split them up by their digits or characters and store them directly in the index. You actually have to do some transformations in order to put it to a form that makes it amenable to uh, doing the kind of you know digit by digit comparison we want to do. And this has to, has to do a lot with how the the, the 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 underlying CPU is going to represent data. Let's say you have an unsigned integer. So we want to maybe split it up by by bytes and store those bytes as our digits in the in, 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 our, in our tree because we can do really efficient single instructions and do comparisons of, of bytes. The problem is though, if we're on Intel CPUs, which are a little Indian, if we go from, you know, from left to right and look at that, then we're actually looking at the, most, the least significant bit first, and that's not gonna do incorrect comparisons. So we're gonna need to flip it and store it in big Indian form and then store the prefixes that way. And I'll show an example of what that looks like in a second. Same problem for sign integers, right? We have the two complements bit in the front. So we have to flip that to make sure that negative numbers are less than positive numbers, and then we can store everything else in, in the Indian form that we, we talked about before. For floats, the more complicated, you have to classify whether they're positive or negative, whether there's normalized or denormalized, and then just try to store them as unsigned integers. Because right? the think about this, the way the, the hardware is going to represent the floating points is it keeps track of where that floating point number is. So that means you know, 33.0 is, is greater than 3.30. So we need to keep track of you know, where that floating point is so that we can do our correct comparison. So we have to normalize everything. For compound in, uh, keys, like if I have two integers, I'm gonna be able to index on that. I just do my transformation, then concatenate them together, and everything works out just fine. But let's look at the unsigned integer problem. Let's say that I wanna store this key here, 168 million. And I wanna store, store this as an unsigned 32-bit integer. So we don't have to worry about two complements here, right? So I can represent this as four one byte hex codes, right? And that would look like this. So now if I store it though in order in big endian versus little endian form, we see that we get two, two totally different sort orders of these, right? So for big endian, the, the most significant bit will be represented first, but in little endian, it's at the bottom. So say now I wanna compare whether three is less than 168 million, in the case of I was stored in little Indian, then I would have to, I wouldn't know until I get to the very bottom, right? But if I'm big Indian, then I would know at the very top that yes, three is less than 168 million, so I, I, I can terminate the search immediately, right? So it would look like this in our tree, right? And so th this would be a path down into store 160 million and we can compare wh whether the value one is there, right? Because if I want to compare, if, I, if I'm stored in little Indian form, the value three, the integer three, at the, the, the most significant bit up here, the hex code is zero, zero, right? But the bottom would be maybe, uh, you know, one zero, right? Yes, one one, and one one would be greater than, greater than this, and therefore I, it would be incorrect. So we flip it around when we want to store this on, on little Indian CPUs to make sure we can do faster comparisons. So we have to do this for all the possible ba basic data types we want to look at. Is this sort of clear? Right, this is something about the architecture we have to take, be mindful of and, and transform our data to make it amenable to be storing in a Radix tree. So now, for this entire class, I've not shown you any benchmark numbers because uh, I want to sort of focus on the fundamentals of, of the databases that we're talking about in this, this course. But I want to show you, in case you get the wrong idea of how amazing skip lists are, uh, some benchmark results we've done in our own research to show that it's not actually the case. So this is a comparison we published in Sigma this year, uh, written by, it was done by a PhD student uh, here at CMU. And we compared uh, a data structure that we implemented called the, called the BW tree. So this is something originally invented by Microsoft uh, for their Hackathon system for SQL Server from five or six years ago. We, when I showed up at CMU, I thought it was an amazing thing. And we, went at, we set out to build our own because it was an open source one. So we built our own open source BW tree, which is a lock-free data structure. And we wanted to see how well it would compare against other existing data structures. Um, the, the, the spoiler is that it sucks and gets crushed. Um, but we also compared the BW tree against the B plus tree, a skip list, and a radix tree. 
And so th for this, this is on a single socket CPU, and we're running with 10 cores or 20, 20 threads. We're doing insert only, read only, and then read and update. And what you see is that for the, the Radix tree crushes everyone, right? It's just so fast to do these quick, you know, breaking up these, these, these values into digits and doing insertions and lookups and updates very quickly. The skip list always loses, right? Um, the BW tree turns out actually almost always loses to, to a regular, uh, uh, actually skip list is doing okay here. No, that might be wrong. Yeah, these might be flop. These might be swept. Swap. There's, there's, there's no way. Yeah, there's no way. Sorry, my fault. Okay, I should have proofread. Um, may, may, reminds me to go check the paper now. Make sure the paper's right. Um, so the Radex tree blows everyone away, right? It's just because the the amount of work you have to do to do comparisons is is so much less than a B plus tree uh, for doing insertions. You don't have to do these splits and merges, right? In the skip list, this is an in-memory database. We're not worried about reading from, from the buffer pool. The, 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 you, you always lose out because the cache misses an, an indirection uh, from, from, from chasing pointers. And the BW tree just has so much overhead to make it lock-free. So this is, again, we'll, we'll just, if you take the advanced class, we'll discuss this. Lock-free sounds like an amazing thing. We want to use this for all our data structures. But at the end of the day, a, a, a solid B plus tree, which is you know, latching that we'll talk about on Wednesday, outperforms it. And the... The, the Radex tree is using latching well. It's not, it's not lock free. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Uh, with Radex tree, is the condensing into like a, a multiple uh, character device with a single that only does it leave, or can that be done in So his, his question is for the Radex tree, when I showed the compression or the, or the, the collapsing, collapsing of, of one node into another node, his question is is that only done at the leaf nodes? Um, or is it done anywhere in the tree? So the textbook definition of a Radix tree does not actually do any of this collapsing. In, in a practical implementation, you'd, you'd want to do this. So in the hyper system, the, the German system I mentioned that was bought by Tableau, they have a paper where they show how to adaptively do this, this collapsing or, or splitting at all different levels. Yeah. So it's one of those things where like a Radix tree was an old idea. It's been around for a while, and it wasn't until like people actually said, "Oh, this seems like a good idea. Let's actually try to make one work in practice." That people recognize, "Oh, this is something we we should revisit." Yes. Is the Radix tree still faster for sequential scans? This question is: Is the Radix tree still faster for sequential scans? I don't have the graph here. The answer is no. B plus tree is always going to win. The skip list does okay too because you just follow along the leaf nodes, but. The, 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 the pointer chasing always loses out. OK. So we have five minutes left, so we'll do a crash course on, on, on inverted indexes. So all the tree indexes we've talked about so far are really good for what are called point queries and range queries. Point queries are find, you know, Andy's, find a customer record where they have the zip code 15217, or range query would be find all the orders within a t particular time range. Right, from June, 27, June 2018 to September 2018. But these data structures are not good for keyword searches. So if I'm going to find all the Wikipedia articles that contain the word Pavlo, right, I can't use my index for that. Because right? think about how you actually would store the Wikipedia article. We, we, saw, this, we saw this before. right? This is the, the sample uh, schema from the real actual Wikipedia software. Right? We have user accounts. You know, pages and there's revisions for pages, right? And then the so the, the actual content of the article is stored here in this content field as a text field. So I could build an index on a text field, but that is actually not what we want, right? Because that's going to be an exact match of all everything that's in, in in my text field. And actually, I think database systems will let you do this, but it's, it's actually a terrible idea because these text fields are going to be you know kilobytes. I think how long is the it's always like some Star Wars article is always the longest Wikipedia article. It might be Pokemon now, right? If, if I build an index on that, I'm storing that entire Pokemon article as a key. And then it, I can only then use it for exact matches. So this, so, so this is not what we want. So even if I go, again, if I try to build my index on content, it won't help for this particular query because it's just going to be, it's, it, I want to find a partial match for this. In actuality, this is actually not the right SQL itself either, because I want to find maybe the, the word Pavlo. 
but this is going to find any substring that matches with the Pablo. Right? A lot of times people want to use these, 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 these data systems, you want to find, you know, show me the word that says Obama, not in the Schmobama or something like that, right? So this is what an inverted index does. So an inverted index is going to, going to map words within a, a record or the attribute that we're indexing to the actual record itself. Right? The, the reason why it's called inverted because think about it like you're storing documents, right? In these Wikipedia articles, instead of storing this, the whole document, you have you you invert it so you you store pointers to those documents based on what words they use. Right, so in the literature, these, these are sometimes called, uh, at least in databases, called full text search indexes. Um, if you go back to like the 1800s, they were they was called concordances, right? So the concordance would be like somebody in the 1800s, some woman spent 16 years making a, essentially an inverted index to to track every single word in that Shakespeare used in his entire like bibliography, right? So. But nobody already calls that now. Invert, we usually call them inverted indexes. So we're not going to have time to go into the actual implementation of this. But essentially, you can think about it as we can use some tree indexes to, to find the, the, the words that we want, and then some additional metadata to say, here's, here's where the word can be found, or here's what words are close to it. So all the major database systems support full text, uh, full text search indexes in some form or the other. Um, the commercial guys actually have, obviously have much better packages. Postgres, of course, has this thing called GIN, the Generalized Inverted Index, uh, I, think, I think it was called. And it has a bunch of different ways you can use B plus trees or hash indexes to represent the data structure itself. Um, and then they have extensions to SQL to allow you to do more complicated things than, than the like that I showed before. So again, all the major systems have, have these, um, but there are also these specialized database systems that are designed explicitly for these full text searches. So Elasticsearch is probably the most famous one that's built on top of Lucene. Um, there's another uh, project called Sphinx, and then Apache Solar, I think, is, I think also might be built on top of Lucene as well. But again, th think about it again, like they build inverted, they're designed to doing searches on inverted indexes, right, instead of doing searches on B plus trees. So the different type of queries we want to execute are go beyond what we saw before, I want to do phrase searches. I want to find exact phrases in my, my text. Uh, I want to do proximity searches. So I want to say, find me, uh, find me all documents or all records where one word is within three words of another word. Right? And I don't care what words come in between it, but I know, know it has to be exactly three words. You do wildcard searches or regular expressions to find more complicated patterns you want to match in, in, your, in your text. Right? And the, the various systems all sort of have their own proprietary extensions to expose this information. I think there's a SQL standard that says how you can write these kind of queries, but no one actually, I think, follows it very well. When you actually implement this, again, what, what distinguishes one implementation from the next is what information they're storing. So at the very least, the most minimum thing you need to store is just an inverted index that maps the words to the records, right? And then how you define a word can depend on you know, how you actually split the text up. You do, you do on punctuation and spaces. Sometimes there's stop words like the word the would always split two, you know things together, things like that. But you can also store things like how often the word appears, where it actually appears, and other metadata about the the, the, the data you're indexing. And then the, the big thing we care about in, in a database system is when we actually update it. So you could just only do this in a batch mode where you say take all my documents or my records and build my index you know once every day. Ideally, we want to keep it up to date so we could maintain a uh, sort of an auxiliary data structure to keep track of all the changes and eventually merge them in into a batch. Again, the different systems do different things. So th the main takeaway from this is that there are additional data structures we could build in our, in, for our table indexes that allows us to do more complicated things than the B plus tree or the hash indexes or the skip list and the radix trees that we've seen before. Because all of those guys are doing key matches. This allows us to do way more complicated things. Again, I realize I'm going fast on this, but uh, if, you, if you're really interested in inverted indexes, then we have a whole course at CMU, 11442 uh, or 642. I think it's just called search engines. So the inverted index is essentially the underlying data structure or implementation, the, the data store of how search engines are implemented. And as I said, they, they store way more complicated things than just the actual key in order to, you know, do, to do rank matching and other things that you may want to do in your system. Okay, so it's my opinion that B plus trees are still the, the best way to go for doing indexes. 
Radix trees are promising, and I think that we're going to start seeing more of them in the future. But the B plus tree, there's a reason why you know it was called in 1979 ubiquitous B plus tree. It's so good. So even now, even with lock-free data structures, um, it's it's always the way to go. So we didn't have time to also discuss geospatial indexes. So think of indexes you want to do matching on like geospatial data. Like I have a I have a map of the United States, I, and it's broken up by state. I want to know whether a given point is in a state or not. So you can't use a B plus tree for that because again, it's not doing key matching the way we, we've talked about so far. So these specialized data structures called geospatial data structures or multimedia data structures or multidimensional data structures that can handle these kind of things. So I, don't, I just want you to be aware that they exist, R trees, quad trees, KD trees. If you want to learn more about that, there's a class 15826 taught by Christos Falutis, the guy who on tour with um, his Iggy Pop cover band. I don't think he's back in the spring, so it may not be offered in the spring, but it might be offered the fall 2019. Okay? Okay. Any questions before we, we're done? All right. Next class, we'll talk about how to make all these indexes thread safe. We we'll focus on crabbing, because you'll need to know this for project two, which I'll be presenting as well on, uh, on, on, on Wednesday. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, have a good week. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the S D Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. -O. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cut, so I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D, that's me. Rolling with fifth one, South Park and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party By the 12 pack case of a 40 a six pack 40 act gets the real bounce I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce They say Bill makes you fat But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter <laughs>